And welcome to the Admiral's Almanac. And in this episode, we have a conversation with Rear Admiral Kevin Quinn, United States Navy, retired. Welcome aboard. This is the Admiral's Almanac, your leadership life connection, bringing leaders from all walks of life into yours so you can take charge, improve your leadership, and improve your life. With the wit and wisdom of your host, Rear Admiral Gary Hall. And thank you. And before we start uh, our conversation with Admiral Kevin Quinn, let me tell you a little bit about him. He graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1977, and he is also a distinguished graduate of the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, where he earned a master's degree in information science. He also attended the Surface Warfare Officer Department at School, graduating first in his class and receiving the City of Newport and Navy League Award. He completed his joint service education at the Armed Forces Staff College. Now, he served both uh, at sea and ashore with distinction, but I just want to mention uh, his service at sea. He started off in the USS uh, Racine, uh, an amphibious ship, and then he was combat systems officer on both the USS O'Brien, a destroyer, and the combat systems officer on USS Chandler, which was a guided missile destroyer. And then he was executive officer on the USS Lake Champlain, a cruiser. Now, then he became the commanding officer of USS Barry, a DDG-52. He also was commander of Destroyer Squadron 28, commander of Task Force 73 in Singapore, which handled the logistics group Western Pacific. And he commanded the aircraft carrier Strike Group 3 and commander of the John C. Stennis Strike Group, and that's where we had a little action together uh, out in the Middle East. Now, when he assumed command of uh, USS Barry in 1995, under his command, Barry received the Battenberg Cup as the best overall ship, aircraft carrier or submarine in the Atlantic Fleet. That meant he was the number one of 177 operational units. He won the Arizona Memorial Trophy for the best combat readiness, the Fleet-Wide Golden Anchor Award for the Best Retention and People Programs, and the Chief of Naval Operations Safety Award. Under his command, Barry was the only and is the only ship ever to win all of these awards in the same year. I think leadership had a little bit to do with that. He then commanded, uh, as I mentioned, Destroyer Squadron 28 and Task Force 60, and his awards include, oh, wait a minute, before I get to his awards, his final assignment was commander of Naval Surface Force Atlantic. He was responsible for 27,000 sailors and 82 surface warships in the Atlantic fleet. Amazing. He was awarded the Navy Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit six times, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Meritorious Service Medal three times, the Navy Commendation Medal twice, the Navy Achievement Medal and various campaign and unit decorations. And also, he was recipient of the Commander-in-Chief U.S. Pacific Fleet Ship Handler of the Year Award. Now, all these technical and military accomplishments today, uh, he is a voracious uh, um, traveler. Uh, He loves exotic foods and experimenting with uh, um, foods and travel and culture and history. Uh, and I had the opportunity to go with him and his uh, wife to Pamplona, where uh, we decided not to run with the bulls, but watch the running of the bulls. So let's get right to it. Here is our talk with Admiral Kevin Quinn. <laughs> Well, welcome, uh, Kevin Quinn, Admiral Kevin Quinn, to the Admiral's Almanac. We're here in the home of Admiral Kevin uh, Quinn, who is recently off back surgery, but has taken the time out to talk to us on the Admiral's Almanac. So, Kevin, let's get right to it. How are you doing today? I feel great today, Gary. It's a beautiful day, and uh, my surgery went well, thanks to terrific Navy medicine, and I enjoyed having lunch with you today. 
Well, Kevin, uh, you're one of my heroes. Uh, for those of you that are listening to this podcast, let me describe uh, Kevin. He's about uh, six foot tall, uh, muscular, brutally handsome, with a little shock of blonde hair, almost like Hubble in the way we were. Isn't that what you modeled your career after? I can't tell you how many people have not described me in that fashion, Gary. There, there we go. Well, Kevin, you were uh, born uh, on the campus of the United States Naval Academy, weren't you? Well, you know, as I look back at it, uh, what, what I've said in the past is I've spent my entire life in the Navy. I was born at the Naval Academy Hospital because my dad was uh, lieutenant commander there, uh, stationed at the academy. And then I was raised in Navy housing my whole childhood, uh, from base to base, East Coast, West Coast, and even two years in uh, Paris, France, when my dad was assigned to the European Command, which used to be there. And then through the whole childhood, continued to live on Navy bases. And when I graduated uh, from high school at 17, my dad flew me to Annapolis, and I went right into the Naval Academy from Navy housing. Wow. Now, did you have a desire to go to the Naval Academy or was your father, did he shape you in that process? Well, that's an interesting question. And I've I've thought about that a lot because uh, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I always had tremendous respect for my father. He was just, uh, he was a real man. I mean, he's a guy, uh, seven children. Uh, He went to work every day. Uh, he came home late, but always in a in a good mood, always treated the kids well. He and my mom were just the perfect couple. And I can remember thinking that uh, that's the kind of guy I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to be a guy that uh, worked at something important and meaningful and good for the country and who was also a very honorable and admirable man in, in every aspect of his life. So essentially, you had a good example of leadership uh, throughout your life through uh, your dad's services, ethics, and uh, love for family. Uh, Absolutely right. Um, And uh, although my dad and my mom have passed away now, uh, I think of them uh, very often. and, And I know in my heart that if it hadn't been for my mom and dad, and my mom, by the way, was also in the Navy in World War II. My dad was an ensign at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese bombed it in '41. And then continued to serve in the Pacific campaign. And then my mom uh, was in uh, the Pentagon at that time. You know, women couldn't go into the combat roles. And they later, after the war, uh, met and fell in love and, and then had uh, had their great uh, family. So they certainly uh, shaped my life, yeah. Well, I'm sure John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara played your parents were uh, in some movie. What a what an inspirational story. Now, um, so you go to the Naval Academy, you spend four years there. What was your major at the Naval Academy? Well, as you know, at the Naval Academy, everybody takes a core engineering curriculum. And then uh, layered on top of that curriculum is a major. Uh, my major, because this is where my interest uh, lay at the time, was political science. And uh, in the political science curriculum, uh, you had to take a language. And so I took French, uh, having gone to kindergarten and first grade in Paris when I was a kid. My dad was stationed there. And then uh, that influence of having taken French helped me become an exchange midshipman to the French Navy the summer before my senior year. And I sailed with uh, aboard a French frigate for about a month and a half. So that Naval Academy experience with that solid engineering foundation, and I, and I got to emphasize that because uh, so many kids, I think, in, in colleges and universities that are going to go into liberal arts majors uh, don't get that solid foundation. And in the Navy, which is a highly technical uh, career uh, with the most advanced ships and submarines and aircrafts in the world, it requires you to have that solid technical scientific foundation uh, to do your job properly. And I think it also helps you as a leader because when the guys who work for you and, and much of my reference zone is life aboard a ship, being a division officer, department head, or the captain of a ship, uh, Part of the thing that that makes an admirable officer, in my opinion, is someone who has good technical professional knowledge. 
And much of that in the Navy is, is founded upon good engineering and scientific knowledge. Well, I took uh, straight engineering at the Naval Academy, and I've always regretted the fact that I didn't have that political science background to make that blend between the hard engineering and then the understanding of the political implications of the Navy. So anyway, so you graduated from the Navy, and you'd already served aboard a frigate with the French Navy. It sounds corny, but was it the romance of the sea that led you to surface warfare? It's a very difficult decision uh, when you're a first-class midshipman about which branch of the Navy you're going to go in. And for those who don't know, it typically boils down to, at least in, the, in those days, you were either going to go be an aviator or, or you were going to go be a submariner or you were going to be a surface warfare officer. Now, I had no interest in becoming a submariner and being down underwater in a tube for months at a time. That just didn't uh, interest me. And... Uh, I didn't have perfect eyesight at the time. So if I went into aviation, I could not have been a pilot. I would have had to have been a backseat guy. And I'm sure I would have enjoyed that and had a good career there. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to follow a career path where I knew I had a chance at being the pilot of a ship, if you would, the captain of a ship, not the second guy, not the supporting guy. I wanted to be the captain of a ship. And so I chose surface warfare as a career path. No, I agree with you uh, 100%. Even aviators, uh, um, the opportunity to command a ship is the ultimate experience and uh, the ultimate reward uh, in leadership and serving. So you get to your first ship. What was your first ship? I went to an amphibious assault ship, uh, uh, an LST, a Newport class LST called USS Racine. And the attractive part of that ship, you know, as I lived it, and then as I look back on it, it had a very small wardroom. There were only 14 officers in the wardroom, and that counts the captain and the executive officer and the supply officer and the assistant. And, and the dentist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and no dentist on that small ship, crew of about 200. So when you were a, a junior officer on that ship, you got involved in everything, whether it was... Um, just stand, standing the deck watch up in the pilot house or being the CIC watch officer down in the combat information center or taking part in all the boat evolutions, uh, even helicopter landing evolutions. I got roped into being the, the landing officer for several uh, helicopter evolutions. And then because you are an amphibious warfare ship, you have to train, in addition to all the normal uh, refresher training events about running a ship that every ship has to do, you also have to go through an amphibious training cycle. And that involved getting down into the, uh, the assault boats, uh, controlling an assault wave of, of these tracked vehicles, these amphibious tracked vehicles, uh, right to the shore, uh, it was exciting. It was a dawn assault on the beach in Coronado, California, you know, as you're training. And we did so much and I got to be involved in so much. I just think as I look back that my professional development was greater than the professional development of guys who had gone to uh, ships where you, you really couldn't get involved in everything. And I found with my experience in the amphibious Navy is your straight shot uh, surface warfare officers or aviators didn't realize the complexity of an amphibious ship. Most complex thing you do in the Navy. So what were some of the leadership challenges you had? So you um, immediately show up on uh, um, your ship and you're made a division officer. And about how many sailors did you lead at that point? Well, it started out with about uh, 15 to 20 sailors. And I moved around from, I, I was aboard that ship for three and a half years. And so I moved around from uh, deck division, which is the bosun mates of the ship. And bosun mates, uh, that's the main battery of an amphibious warship is the bosun mates. They handle the rigging. They handle the boats. Um, that's the heart and soul of a ship was the bosun mates on that ship. And then I did a tour as a division officer for the gunner's mates. We only had three-inch guns uh, on that ship at port and starboard, uh, three-inch guns. Uh, but there I learned about surface gunnery. 
Uh, then I was assigned to the engineering department. And so now I got a chance to interact with uh, the engineers. We call them snipes, the engine room snipes and work that world aboard a ship. And then after doing that for about a year, I got moved up to be the communications officer and electronic maintenance officer of the ship. And then at one point, the captain calls me up to his cabin and says the operations department head is leaving and I want you to be my new operations department head. And I was kind of blown away and honored at that point because I had never been to department head school. I had just been to division officer course. But the captain, of course, had observed me over these years and knew that I'd been to every department on the ship and knew a lot about amphibious operations. And so he fleeted me up to operations officer, a role in which I served for a year. And I learned a ton in that capacity. So just your explanation there just shows the the baseline of experience that uh, shaped your entire um, career and also the fact that you were mentored and identified as a, a fast tracker. Uh, bosun's mates. I love bosun's mates. They've got the biggest hearts and biggest muscles uh, on the and ship. The big, and the biggest tattoos. And the biggest tattoos. And uh, they uh, respond to leadership. Do you have any uh, um, stories of a leadership challenge with bosun's mates? Well, you know, in those days, uh, those are some bad years in the Navy. You, you, yeah, that, you remember. We, we were right? at that time, uh, we were fighting the drugs. The drug, the, the drug epidemic was in full force uh, there in the late 70s and, and early 80s. And so uh, you had the challenge of leading guys and trying to keep them out of that, out of that world and then dealing with the, um, the, um, the responsibilities of of having to cope with guys who had trouble staying at, staying out of trouble, and both mates, as you know, have kind of a reputation both uh, on large aboard the ship or on the beach of uh, getting into trouble. So, getting your division together, talking to them about uh, the way to succeed, talking to them about having the, the right kind of lifestyle on the ship and off the ship, and how to stay out of trouble. Uh, on liberty uh, overseas. Uh, those were challenges, but if, if you could get your subordinate leaders, those petty officers, the leading petty officers and the chiefs uh, all singing the same tune with you and all speaking the same message, uh, then you could influence those young guys, um, those young guys' lives. And that's what I tried to do. And the lesson I learned there not just with the bosun mates, but with the snipes and throughout that time on that first ship was you, you can't do it alone as a leader. You have to develop uh, your immediate subordinates to be leaders as well and to buy into your philosophy of, of how you be professional, how you have uh, self-discipline, which I think is the best kind of discipline and how you can move forward and move up in your career if you just adhere to some basic principles of personal and professional conduct. So developing your subordinate leaders, I think, is one of the most important lessons that any leader learns. Wow. So you were you desired to lead, you were committed in your leadership, and you were strong in your personal responsibilities, your responsibilities of your division, and mentoring your sailors, which I think a lot of uh, civilian organizations don't even think about uh, mentoring uh, their employees on behavior uh, outside of the work environment, but we're building in the Navy uh, um, great citizens. So you then went on to a department head tour eventually. So what ship were you a department head on? So I had two great department head tours. I uh, First, I graduated number one from my department head school, which kind of allowed me to have the pick of the litter uh, for ship assignments. And so I got uh, the job as the combat systems off officer on one of the brand new Spruance class destroyers. And I kind of chuckle about that because all of those ships have been retired from the Navy at this point, but it was a fantastic job. And here I went from the amphibious world to the very robust combat systems world with, with the uh, major uh, caliber deck guns with, with uh, torpedoes, with surface-to-air missiles, the whole complement of warfighting capability, including sonar, which I had no experience with uh, before. 
And I love that tour. Uh, I had deployed twice aboard my amphibious ship. I deployed again to the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf region aboard uh, USS O'Brien, that first uh, uh, destroyer. Okay, the U.S. O'Brien, for those that don't know, that's the only ship in the Navy which uh, had green ball caps. It did indeed. In fact, I got that assignment when I was in department head school, and there happened to be a pub in Newport, Rhode Island, where department head school was, called the uh, O'Brien's Pub. And you can guess where I was the night that I received my assignment to USS O'Brien. In the O'Brien's Pub, having a Jameson with a Guinness chaser. And and buying an O'Brien's Pub ball cap. Fantastic. The other thing point I wanted to make out for our listeners is the time periods that we're talking about here, uh, women were not serving uh, on ships at that point. That comes uh, later, which... Uh, um, so when we say men, uh, it's because at that point in time, there were only uh, uh, men on board uh, ships. So I would call the, these years of department head and division officer as tactical leadership. That's your down on the deck plates. Sometimes I say brute force leadership where you're hands on uh, leading uh, young sailors. So, but now after that, I believe you were, again, number one in uh, um, department head school, number one department head on your ship. Uh, you are on the fast track. You've got a uh, rocket strapped to your back and you're headed up and you were identified by the surface warfare community to be aid. Well, actually, Gary, uh, correct me. After O'Brien, I went to another destroyer. Oh, that's right. That's right. In those days, you did 18 to 22 months on the first ship as a department head, and then went to another one for another 18 to 22 months. And the second ship was USS Chandler, one of the really super uh, new ships in the Navy. Uh, It was called, uh, it was a guided missile destroyer. And we used to call it a double-ended cruiser because it had big missile launcher forward and a big missile launcher aft. Really all the firepower of a cruiser packed into a destroyer hull. And I just built upon my professional knowledge from O'Brien with a more complex combat system, a little bit larger crew, a little bit more seniority in the chief's mess and down on the deck plates in the E1 to E6. And so that helped me further refine my leadership at a next level, because even though it was just another department head job, it was a step up as far as combat capability and complexity of a warship and complexity of the wardroom and of the rest of the crew. So you had to uh, develop, uh, further develop your own knowledge of the weapon systems and then leading a more complex uh, um, crew. And those ships were the great ships that helped us win the Cold War. Exactly right. They were the most capable destroyers in the world, period. Absolutely. So you finish up there. And again, I know you were the number one uh, department head uh, of uh, Kevin is nodding uh, in the affirmative. Uh, select You were then selected by the surface warfare community to be aid to the number one surface war, operational surface warfare officer, uh, um, Commander Naval Surface Forces Pacific. And I learned a lot of that tour uh, also. And, and here's why. The admiral, and it was a vice admiral, a three-star admiral, who, who served as Commander, Commander Naval Surface Force Pacific, was just one of the most uh, admirable officers that I have ever served for. Uh, his name was George W. Davis, and he was a tall, lanky gentleman from South Carolina. And he had married this beautiful young lady from Los Angeles years ago when he was a young officer. And she was ter- a terrific example and role model uh, as well. But you couldn't find a more admirable and distinguished an honest and honorable man than George Davis. And to see him interact with other flag officers, whether they were subordinate flag officers to him, and he was a three-star, or whether they were his peers, and he was very well regarded among his peers, or more senior flag officers, four-star admirals, like the chief of naval operations, he just always carried himself uh, with an air of professionalism, and dis, uh, distinction and integrity that I would marvel at. And I kind of would, I was sort of learning at the footstep of the real pro uh, 
having having the opportunity to serve with somebody like Admiral George Davis and and that helped give me a glimpse into leadership leadership at the admiral level at the flag level and how they deal with uh subordinate admirals captains who might be commodores of squadrons and the captains of ships uh that was a great learning experience and and one that I will never forget and what year was that? What time frame was that? This is about 1987 and 88. Okay. The reason I ask that is I was uh, aide to three stars at that point as well. One of them was not ethically the best in the second admiral I was an aide to, uh, was a gentleman such as you've described of uh, Admiral Davis. And I won't mention those two admirals' names because it would identify the one that I didn't feel was ethical. But you learn from unethical leaders as well as from ethical leaders. And so you go from uh, your father who presented the same type of ethical work ethic and gentleman behavior uh, at home to uh, being an aide to a three-star who displayed the same traits. So uh, you are getting mentored all along. And I think sometimes uh, young people need to identify a mentor to to mentor them. So let's uh, fast forward. When did you wind up commanding the greatest ship in the Navy? Well, before I could get to the greatest ship in the Navy, I had to be the second in command of a, of a ship as the XO. And I was the XO of an Aegis cruiser, Again, the latest and greatest type of warship Pattern in the U.S. Navy and, and in, and in uh, the world. And that was a, another great experience. At leadership of a ship at the one step down from the captain. Basically, my old captain would say, uh, executive officer, XO, you run the ship and I command the ship. And so I got that great experience of being able to run a warship of that size bigger than, more complex than a destroyer, uh, and work for some very admirable professional captains along the way. And then I was very fortunate that I got selected to command one of the first Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, the USS Barry DDG-52. And here's the thing, and here's the beautiful part about what the Navy does to develop its leaders. All of this experience that I've just told you about, the division officer tour, the first department head tour, the second department head tour, the tour is second in command of a cruiser, all helped prepare me and develop me so that I could be um, an effective commanding officer of a warship. So that when I stepped aboard that ship, USS Barry, and I flew aboard the ship by helicopter at first, I felt 100% completely confident in my professional ability and my personal capacity to be a good commanding officer of that ship. I had great confidence from day one when I stepped aboard, which helps you be an effective leader for your entire tour. Well, I want to point out, Kevin, that you had true confidence, not a false confidence. No. And we've had people go into command with a false confidence that they were prepared when really they weren't. I hope that maybe this podcast will get to some of our active duty flag officers now, and they are rethinking to try and reincorporate the amount of experience that you gained before you took command of a ship based on the fact that we've had two uh, horrific collisions at sea taking sailors' lives who captain by those that I don't think had the same at sea experience you had. And, uh, you know, we can, we don't need to hash that out now, but, uh, but here's another interesting thing about, uh, USS Barry, Gary, cause you mentioned that there were no women aboard, uh, com combatant ships. USS Barry was one of the first ships in the Navy, combatant ships in the Navy to have women integrated into the crew, including into the wardroom. So when I stepped aboard that ship, I had female officers in my wardroom. I had female chief petty officers in my chief petty officer's mess. And I had uh, female junior enlisted sailors uh, in that uh, portion of the ship. And here's the, the, here's the insight I came away from from that. That's one of the best things the Navy ever did was incorporate yes. women aboard those warships because – the women across the board, from the more senior female officers to the most junior sailor, female sailor, were some of the best officers and sailors. Well, everybody's a sailor on a ship. Some of the best sailors uh, that I served with. 
And so I'm a strong proponent of the integration into women aboard our uh, combatant warships. And, and I saw the same thing. Uh, Tarawa had 10% of the crew was uh, female and they, they need to get a little bit um, higher percentage, which they have at this point um, to have that uh, leadership throughout of uh, um, women. But yeah, some of the best sailors, uh, ship handlers, officers uh, I had were the women that were uh, newly integrated into time at sea. So now the USS Barry has produced quite a number of flag officers. And I think my classmate, uh, one went on to four stars and another classmate who commanded Barry was one of the few that didn't make, <laughs> didn't make Admiral. I'll leave his name out. He might've been before you, I think. Anyway, so you, you've got to have, I always said when you're in command of a ship, um, there's going to be three times when the captain saves the ship uh, um, and saves life or limb. But that's the good news, only three times during a three-year tour. But the bad news is you don't know when those three times are going to happen. Did you have a, a time on board, uh, Barry, where um, you were the one individual that had to save that ship? Uh, I don't think there was that time because of how well-prepared my crew was from junior. Again, I include everybody on board that ship in that statement because we prepared thoroughly for every evolution. Uh, the more you prepare and think about what could happen and what your response would be if something did happen, and the more you brief that uh, to everybody involved in whatever evolution you're doing, even coming back into your own home port, uh, there is, again, this sense of confidence that not only can you do it when everything goes well, but you're prepared and you have a backup in case something doesn't go well. Um, I can remember we we had this experience. I had this experience that when I was the Commodore of a destroyer squadron, and of course, this is after my command of Barry, it was near the end of my uh, my tour uh, as the Commodore, and we were on deployment. And uh, we were doing boarding, visit boarding search and seizure operations against suspected terrorist shipping. And so as the Commodore, I am letting the captain run his ship. We just got a new captain aboard that ship on deployment. And he had never served aboard an Arleigh Burke class. My flagship was an Arleigh Burke at the time. And what you typically do in those situations is you hail the merchant uh, by a bridge to bridge radio and you tell them that you're going to come aboard in accordance with international law and conduct a, a you know, search for illegal cargoes. And they all always comply because you have the big guns, right? And they don't have any anything like that. So we sent uh, a boat, one of the ship's boats, over with a boarding team and to search the boat. And then as they were coming back, the weather had picked up a bit. The swells had picked up. And uh, the the boat uh, was still alongside the merchant. And so you get a lot of extra movement when you're alongside a, you know, a hull like that. The, the, the movement of the waves as it, as it hits the, uh, the hull creates more turbulence. And our boat uh, capsized, got flipped over. And so then we went into sort of a man overboard right. procedure. Very dangerous. Um, and so we maneuvered, we we're maneuvering t towards the, the my, our sailors who were in the water. And as the captain maneuvered, I could tell he didn't, he didn't have the experience handling an Arleigh Burke class destroyer. And every ship class is different. How it's going to behave to engine orders, how it's going to uh, behave to rudder orders how it performs when you're trying to twist while backing down. It's all these things. And you're taking the weather in consideration. And I saw that what he was doing was not going to save our sailors right. in expeditious uh, time frame. So I had him clear. We were on the starboard bridge wing and giving orders, you know, into the pilot house where the helmsman and the Lee helmsman, the, 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 the sailors that, uh, that control the heading of the ship, the rudders, and, and the engines. So I asked him to clear all the sailors off that bridge wing. And I started advising him on 
what kind of engine combinations and rudder combinations so that he would be the one calling in right fall rudder, port engine back two thirds or whatever the engine combinations were in order for us to be able to sail, save those sailors and get them hauled up aboard the ship. That's not something you plan for. I no. hadn't thought about that in the planning for that evolution. Um, but when it happened, because I had the experience ship handling USS Barry, and I used to play around at sea in the middle of the ocean, engine combinations and backing with rudder. Right. I felt 100% confident I knew what I was doing. And uh, so the captain got to be the one giving all the orders from as far as his sailors could, could see. And I was just the guy looking out over the side of the sailors, just kind of out of the corner of my eye, giving him advice. But, it, but having great concern for my my sailors, his sailors too, uh, who were who were in the water. We got every one of those sailors back aboard the ship. We got the boat righted. We got the boat back aboard the ship, and the mission was successful. But those were those were tense times. Wow, when you tell that story, it gives me goosebumps because I can smell the salt water. I can hear the waves. I can feel the adrenaline rush when you have sailors in the water. And I've had uh, sailors in the water too. It's a you feel responsible to those moms and dads out there that you, you're going to bring their son or daughter back home safely. But what I'm hearing is uh, a responsibility to train in depth throughout your career of um, leading in depth. In other words, when you're a division officer, um, empowering your uh, young petty officers as leaders, uh, as the Commodore, empowering your um, uh uh, other ships captains, but also as Captain of Barry, empowering your the crew uh, to lead because sometimes the youngest voice might have the the right answer. You can't be the man in charge or woman in charge and think that you know um, everything. Boy, what's uh, some very inspirational uh, um, stories? Wow! And then after that, is that when you became uh, executive assistant to? Uh, at the youngest four-star admiral in the Navy. Or that was a little looking. bit later, because first I had to go to the Pentagon and learn how the Pentagon uh, worked for about uh, three years. And there's really no way to learn that, that system, that process, without going and doing it. I learned a lot uh, in that job, but um, my true love, my most favorite jobs were at sea. At sea with sailors. With the sailors, doing the country's work. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, there's uh, people out there, you can't understand the feeling of uh, being command of America's sons and daughters uh, that are the lifeblood of our, our Navy, Navy, Army, Air Force, uh, Marines. But uh, uh, the greatest people talk about the greatest generation from World War II, but I think the next greatest generation are young sailors and officers that we have uh, today. I couldn't agree more. Um, I've been so impressed as, as, the, dec- as the decades ticked by, you know, in, in my career, it was just one generation of great sailors after another. And when people were bad mouthing young people, I said, not these young people, these sailors are terrific. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you did your Pentagon penance. And uh, at that point, uh, was Admiral Natter the commander? Uh... Well, see, I rolled back to be the Commodore of a destroyer squadron at that point. Oh, okay. So I had a squadron of about six destroyers working for me. And I was the battle group's uh, sea combat commander. So I was responsible for the admiral in charge of the battle group, which includes the aircraft carrier, the cruisers, destroyers, frigates, for the defense of that battle group uh, from submarines and from surface ships and for my ships carrying out all the the numerous duties uh, to which they were assigned. After that, I went to be the executive assistant for Admiral Natter, the four-star. Now, we, I've talked to you once before about, uh, so you're a, a Navy captain. You're the executive assistant uh, um, to a four-star, which is a, an interesting role that you do everything from prepare uh, talking points to advising him to uh, pointing out his ribbons are in the wrong order. So here he is, uh, four-star of the fleet. We only have seven of those in the Navy. Did you ever feel like you had to lead the admiral or coax him along? I never, of course, I never felt like I had to lead the admiral. I Not, mean, yeah. Admiral Natter was a very powerful, forceful leader. I mean, that guy was impressive. 
you know, a true professional, a hero, a silver star in Vietnam. He still had part of his arm, uh, you know, that had been blown off. You could see the scars to that uh, day. He was one, in, one of the riverboat guys in Vietnam, a riverboat sailor. And, uh, you know, a lot of firefights and a lot of uh, guys that didn't come home from those types of uh, battles. So he was tested in fire and he was forged in those type of uh, experiences. And uh, he was a very dynamic and very forceful leader. What you learn from a guy like that is not only um, uh, his traits as a guy whose command included tens of thousands of sailors, all the aircraft, all the submarines, all the uh, surface warships in the Atlantic fleet, half of the United States Navy he's responsible for, and how he was able to identify the key issues, the key pressure points that he needed to focus on to make sure that the fleet was combat ready, and that the ships that we sent forward on deployment into the uh, various war zones around the world were ready to fight on arrival, because that is the standard. The standard is not passing inspection. The standard is is being able to fight and win on arrival. And Admiral Natter never uh, forgot that fact, and he always focused his efforts on that uh, on that goal. Um, he's one of the best uh, surface warfare officers we've had in the Navy, uh, accepted company. Um, but his daughter then became a Lamps helicopter pilot right. and has done tremendous. She was pilot uh, of the year one pilot year. Of the, pilot of the year. So quite a, an amazing um, family. Now, I have to confess, the reason I asked about when you were an aide is the same time I was an aide. Uh, when you were cruising on your Spruance class destroyers, I was a Lamps pilot out at sea on Spruance class destroyers. Um, from the Naval Academy, I saw you in the yard, didn't know you from those days of uh, port calls and deployments in Westpac. Uh, I saw you, uh, again, a young Robert Redford type, only taller than Robert Redford. <laughs> um, you know, and it wasn't until uh, we were both selected for flag officer that we met and uh, developed a, a close professional and personal um, relationship. So what was it like to... Um, command uh, a carrier strike group? To me, that's really uh, the epitome of naval leadership, afloat naval leadership. I mean, a, a U.S. Navy carrier strike group, we used to call them carrier battle groups, we now call them carrier strike groups, I think is, it, it would be the highlight of, of any naval officer's career. Uh, here you have this fighting force centered on the aircraft carrier, which was my flagship, the USS John C. Stennis, and comprised of, depending on ships assigned, cruisers and destroyers and frigates and sometimes submarines assigned, and the carrier air wing. And you see these commercials for the Navy, and there's the carrier strike group steaming uh, at sea, and their aircraft flying around the carrier like bees around a hive, and they're landing and they're getting propelled off the ship by the catapults. Uh, and there's all these warships around it. You really feel like you are the heart and soul of the Navy's combat capability at sea. It's the most amazing, fulsome feeling that I think any naval officer could have. Uh, absolutely. Now, uh, for our listeners, uh, well, Admiral Quinn was uh, commander of a carrier battle strike group. I was commander of an expeditionary strike group. I was shore based in Bahrain uh, um, over in the Middle East in the um, Persian Gulf. And I have to tell you that occasionally um, great leaders need to get together for uh, some brainstorming and uh, Kevin actually maneuvered his battle group so that he was within flying distance of meeting up with me, spending a couple nights uh, um, in Bahrain where we um, walked the back alleys of uh, Bahrain, maybe have gone to a couple of restricted uh, locations. I think the statute of limitations, that is is over with. But uh, a tremendous career. Have, so do you have any thoughts on your philosophy of leadership, which I think we could tease out of this conversation. Well, 
hopefully you saw, especially in the early part of the discussion of your career, is I think uh, a leader has to be professionally competent. And there are a lot of facets to that little jewel. You really, you have to know what you're doing. Because if you want uh, the people who work for you to have confidence in you, to have faith in you, to feel like you'll know what you're, you're doing when the times get tough and the pressure is on, they have to feel like you know what the hell you're doing, that you're competent, particularly in the military, in the, in the war fighting side of the Department of Defense. Uh, they have to have confidence that that guy who's up on the bridge or the guy who's the tactical action officer in the, in the combat information center, the TAO, or the captain on the bridge, that they know how to fight that ship as, and get the best capabilities out of that ship and, the, and that crew that they can possibly get so that you will win. You will win in every conflict. In my um, command philosophy, when I had Barry, and the philosophy never really changes, uh, I said that Barry is a warship, and it was built to fight. And our job as the Barry's crew, and my job in particular as the captain, was to know how to fight that ship to the best of its capabilities, get every ounce of war fighting capability at, out of it, with the goal of when we went into battle, we would win. Victory in battle was my loads, my star that I was aiming for. And sometimes people would say, well, why aren't you emphasizing deterrence and, and, and uh, trying to stop things from happening? And my answer was this. The way you deter, the way you dissuade potential enemies from getting into a conflict with you is if you, they know that you are so combat capable, so lethal, so well prepared, so well outfitted in the form of combat systems and weapons that they'd be fools to try to go to sea and take you on because they would lose and we would achieve victory in battle. Yes, the overwhelming ability to defeat is a great deterrent. Well, Sun Tzu, I think, said the greatest general is the one who wins the battle without firing a single shot. Absolutely, and I think we did that with the Cold War. I think we did. I'm, so, I'm confident we did. So, but I think you can translate, you know, we, that's from a military perspective, but I think you can uh, um, relate that to almost any business that you have to be professionally knowledgeable and in command of your area of expertise in order to um, inspire others to, to lead. And that's part of it. And, and we also talked about character and, and, uh, integrity right. and all those things that make people want to follow you. Right. I mean, you can be a drug lord leader and be a great drug lord leader, <laughs> but not have any sort of ethical or moral uh, fiber to right. you. So also uh, all this uh, strength and of character, integrity and uh, leadership prowess has led uh, Kevin to go on to be a tremendous uh, world traveler. Uh, he's run with the bulls. Well, really, he didn't run with the bulls because I was with him. And once we converted <laughs> kilograms to uh, pounds, we realized how big those bulls were. And we decided to drink with them uh, instead. So, uh, Kevin, um, do you have a book that's influenced you? Do you have a, any sort of uh, book that you could recommend to others? Well, I think uh, any of the great books on sea power, the influence of sea power on history, uh, for example, and then some of the fundamental warfare philosophy book, like the Sun Tzu book, Art of War, that I that I mentioned earlier, those are two totally different, um, you know, books. Two to- two totally different types of uh, education, uh, but they help. I think you understand the importance of what you're doing and the importance of, uh, in my case, uh, the power that the U.S. Navy brings to our nation's ability to be successful and prosperous. And then at the same time from the art of war of how to be, how to fight or to engage in a conflict in a way that you can achieve your goals uh, without losing any of your shipmates in the process. 
Right. So, Kevin, I, through this talk, I see you had the desire to lead and therefore took the commitment to lead by going to the Naval Academy and then uh, following a, a 30 plus year career in the Navy is definitely a commitment. And your responsibilities were that you uh, knew your trade craft mm-hmm. inside and out from uh, fore to aft, uh, port to starboard, uh, and that you were held yourself accountable that uh, you would always win and never lose in combat, which again is a, a vision that you communicated well with your um your crews. So, Kevin, uh, I admire you as a professional naval officer, a friend, and a leader. Do you have anything to sum up your discussion here today? And I want everybody to know that Kevin is on muscle relaxants after uh, <laughs> major surgery. Surgery. No, what I, what I want everybody to know is sitting here, I'm looking at a truly great leader, a truly great naval officer, and uh, Admiral Gary Hall, who I've learned a lot from Admiral Hall. I've learned about the whole capability that our helicopter force in the Navy brings to our combat capability. And I've also learned a lot about leadership because this is a guy who truly embodies uh, uh, the the finest qualities uh, of a leader, whether it's a leader in his church or his community or a leader at sea. Uh, That's what we all have in Gary Hall, and I'm proud to call you my friend. Thank you very much, uh, Shipmate, and thank you for joining uh, the Admiral's Almanac. And you've just heard Fiction or Fact from the Admiral's Almanac, an interview with Rear Admiral Kevin Quinn. Wow, what a great uh, conversation with uh, Admiral Quinn. I hope my listeners uh, really enjoyed that. And if you did, go to your Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the Admiral's Almanac for future uh, discussions just like this. If you're a young sailor or if you're a young college student thinking about the Navy, I'm sure uh, the stories of Admiral Kevin Quinn inspired you and gave you goosebumps and inspired you to lead, to maybe lead in, the, in one of our armed forces, uh, which are true leadership laboratories, and you'll be a better man or woman uh, for serving your country uh, in uniform. So again, thank you, Admiral Quinn. And this is the Admiral's Almanac, and we are out. Until next time, thank you.